So thanks a lot. Oh. This is, has been great, very enjoyable. And um, I'm actually very happy to be here. And I'm going to be talking about ancient genomes and human genomes. But before doing that, I really want to give a shout out to my PhD students uh, who really led um, this work with tears and a little hard work. So um, I am going to uh, make the claim and try to convince you that there are ancient deletions that is still variable in the human genome. And these ancient deletions, that, uh, polymorphic deletions, are maintained. Some of them are functional, and these functional ones are maintained through balancing selection. So before going into that much detail, um, the big question that we have been asking is, what makes us human? And that is, of course, a gigantic question. I don't have any claims of answering it. But we try to do so through evolutionary genomics uh, approaches. And doing so is a little bit tricky because when we actually look at human genomes and compare two human genomes to each other, we are looking at 3 billion base pairs. There are two copies of that, actually, in each uh, individual. And when you compare two human genomes to each other, you're suddenly looking at 0.1% difference. That's really uh, a needle in the ha haystack kind of um, situation, uh, a library of Babel situation, if you are into literature. So then the SNPs, the variants, other than GWAS, it becomes very tricky to weed out what really matters. And to avoid this in a way, we want to look at a different type of variation that we recently appreciated. And these are much larger events, deletions, duplications, inversions of large segments of DNA. And these are, if you ask me, are interesting for two different reasons. One, they are big, and because they are big, we assume that they have a bigger functional impact. And second, they actually affect a huge amount of base pairs. When you compare two human genomes, we estimate suddenly it's not 0.1% difference, but it's 1% difference when you actually include all these insertions, deletions, inversions to the mix. So we are very excited about this because we think that this may actually uh, explain some of the missing heritability that people actually talked about uh, today and yesterday. And in fact, there's precedent. There are actually, you know, I think Anne Stone is in, either in the audience or in this meeting, and her work, for instance, is amazing because we have this one example, at least, uh, of the amylase copy number, the salivary amylase copy number, which is associated with starch consumption, which um, helps digest starch. And this is something, the copy number of amylase is uh, 4 to 17, 4 to, 4 to 17 copies in humans that varies. And that actually differentiates us from chimpanzees, who have only two diploid copies. Plus, it shows remarkable variation that is structured around high starch consuming versus non uh, low starch consuming populations, potentially indicating some sort of response to cultural change. So it's amazing. Plus, from the biomedical side, it's been recently associated with, um, uh, with obesity. So, uh, we have a slum dunk in this gene, and we hope that we will find other genes, other variants similar to this. So then the question becomes a little bit more narrower, still big, that why do these very large structural variants still linger in the population? Why are they maintained? Because if they are really beneficial, then it should be fixed uh, through classical sweeps. And if it is not beneficial, detrimental, um, then it should be eliminated from the population by purifying selection. So why are they still there? And to answer this, we wanted to go to extremes. We want to find the really old ones that, uh, that evolved before human Neanderthal divergence so that we can say that these, really, uh, these are the deletions that have been maintained for a long time. So there has to be a reason, an evolutionary reason. The problem is that it's very hard to date um, using genetics. The mutation rate is still we have no idea what's going on. And for the different regions of the genome, even if you know the genome-wide average, we don't know what's happening for individual regions. So what we did instead is a direct comparison of polymorphic human deletions to Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes that are now available. So suddenly we can actually take, um, this is the chromosomal location, 
and this is basically a polymorphic deletion that has been already reported in humans. And this is a gene track where this is the exon and this is an intron. And when we actually align Neanderthal and Denisovan reads, next generation sequencing reads, into, onto the human um, reference genome, you can actually see that there, there's a missing gap. That means that Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes also carry that deletion in them. So that's cool because we are suddenly looking at a variation that is polymorphic here, plus it's shared with Neanderthals with this lineage. So of course we didn't go through all thousands of different uh, polymorphisms one by one. We come up with a relatively straightforward bioinformatic pipeline. To do this, I'm going to gloss over all the methodology because of the, uh, because of the time limitations. But here's our little deletions. That's the average read depth. That's what we expect. These are the regions where um, Neanderthals and Denisovans actually show very little, um, very few numbers of reads indicating a deletion. So we actually come up that uh, of the 14,000 uh, plus deletion polymorphisms uh, in humans that we tested, we find about 427 shared deletions. We did a lot of work to validate and confirm these, so we are very confident in these, but we are probably missing a lot. So, just, so, um, just saying. And um, then, of course, we wanted to understand how many, where, why, are the, why is this sharing happening? And what we did is um, do, again, lots of analysis of the haplotypes surrounding these deletions, their frequencies, etc., to make sure that we are looking at, we're doing it correctly. I'm not going to bore you with that, but we found that 38 of these shared deletions are coming from Neanderthals. Uh, it's it actually Intergress much more recently. And uh, we also find 15 deletions that are actually recurrent. The good thing about deletions, there are many negative things about deletions because it's very tricky to work with, but when we are actually looking at the exact breakpoints, if the breakpoints are different, you can pretty safely say that they are actually recurrent. So we can actually say that 15 of them are definitely recurrent. It occurred uh, at least two times, maybe some of them are three times in the human and Neanderthal lineages independently. And then majority of the sharing is happening because of ancestral structure, that the ancestral population here already carrying that variations and that variations have been maintained for a long time into the human lineage. So then of course the question becomes, okay, that's great. These are, there are ancient variations in the human genome. Um, what, what do they do? And for most of them, almost always, they seem to do nothing. So they are just end of a distribution. So we did, uh, this is a very basic graph, but we did, uh, we did simulate, it, simulate this data several times. And human deletions in general are already depleted for exonic sequence. And ancient deletions are even more depleted. It's a very small fraction of these ancient deletions are exonic. So the conclusion from that, the majority of these guys are neutral. So the model uh, would be that you, um, ha if you hit an exon, it's very likely that you'll be eliminated from the population through negative selection. So the question then becomes even more specific. What are these like little guys, the 4% or 3% that happens to be exonic and ancient? And there it becomes very interesting, I think, because we are uh, looking at genes that makes a lot of sense. In fact, um, a couple of these genes have been mentioned. The, the cytochromes here were uh, mentioned by Dr. Stern. The, the MTB1 is mentioned by Dr. Rowe, which we co uh, collaborate. And uh, they are actually hitting immune system genes, diet gene, xenobitic me metabolism genes. There's one exonic deletion that happens to be related to growth hormone receptor and seems to be important for infant uh, growth cycles. So it's very cool. It makes a lot of sense. And we think, uh, so we basically hypothesize that this is happening because of balancing selection. The problem, of course, we did a lot of different, we used a lot of different um, measures for balancing selection and selection in general. I'm showing here uh, population, uh, population differentiation, FST, of the haplotypes that are surrounding these deletions. And these, um, the more white, that they're more genetic, we basically compared to the genome-wide expectation. So this is not direct FSTs, but rather significance. The wider it is, the more significant the population differentiation. So here, uh, this is a very complicated figure. I don't, I'm not going to go it, but here you're seeing the genes. Here you're seeing the populations. What I want to say here is twofold. One, 
it is not, uh, these are non-neutral. These genes are evolving under non-neutral forces. And second thing that I want to say is that um, the, it seems that the forces that are acting on it are not traditional balancing selection, but it differs from gene to gene. And I think I would be very depressed if it was five years ago, but now, um, but now thanks to uh, several people's work, including our own, but uh, mostly to, um, to Aida Andres in Max Planck, we actually have this emerging notion that complex balancing selection co seems to be a thing um, to consider uh, to understand human genetic variation. So what I mean by complex genetic variation, uh, complex balancing selection, I'm mentioning any force uh, that act over time that seem to maintain variation more than expected by chance. And this can be geography specific variation, where you, one geography is actually, um, in one geography, one type of variant is favored and another geography it's not favored. So that you have, um, you have allele B here and allele A here, both of them are maintained in the population for a long time. It can be oscillating through time. So at one point in time, it will be better to have one, pide, uh, one type of allele and another time it will be another allele, so it's maintained again. Or there are actually other types of uh, complex balancing selection where you can imagine uh, what people, uh, people actually give a lot of ideas to me in this conference that where you can actually have um, some sort of um, within, uh, within the um, physiology, you can actually have one advantage of the same allele while the other allele has another advantage. So you can have um, a cost benefit thing going on um, in a particular diet or a particular pathogen pressure or a particular um, uh, or a particular sexual selection setting. So overall, again, I wanted to uh, tell you a story about ancient deletions, and I hope that I managed to convince you that there are actually ancient functional structural variants uh, that seems to be very um, that seems to be very important. They are very common and they are biomedically very relevant, and uh, they are maintained in the population through complex balancing selection. And I think each of we just published this paper in molecular biology uh, evolution is just in online advanced access. So we basically discuss all of these genes independently. I don't have time to do so. Uh, but again, thanks a lot for, I didn't do any of the work. I actually, uh, uh, so thanks again to Onta. And um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, so two questions. So we have time for two questions. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, if you could comment on your work on the immune uh, system uh, genetic regions. Okay. So, base. <clears throat> Sorry? So, uh, the question is um, can you comment on the, Im the immune system genes essentially that we found? And, of course, immune system is a. Is a hard thing to define, you know, a lot of genes are related to immunity or defense one way or the other, but uh, we seem to um, have um, at least uh, two genes, the MTB1, which is associated with Crohn's disease, and LC3C, which is associated with another autoimmunity. Um, I'm just going to comment on this because it's kind of interesting. That's a very common deletion, uh, all reaching uh, almost uh, 40, 50 percent in some populations, and it's associated with increased risk of psoriasis. It seems that uh, that's not related to immunity directly, but rather it's related to um, how, much, um, how much access the external, um, external pressures can actually act and the real inflammation come from the HLA locus. So it's basically some sort of a joint action of the HLA locus and this locus. And I think almost everything in this balancing selection um, setting would be these kind of complex interactions where it's not just one gene, but multiple genes affecting a particular phenotype. And yes. I would like to have you comment on the drug metabolism deletions, uh, in particular 2A6, if you would. I'm curious Wh about Which that. one? 2A6, CYP2A6. 2A6 is up at the top, top one. Right there. Right there, yeah. Hold on. That tells me. <laughs> oh, 2A6, oh, yeah, yeah. So, 
Okay, so this is very weird because I don't know much <clears throat> about drug metabolism because um, I didn't think about it much before this study. So this particular uh, thing is extremely weird because it's a fusion gene. Uh -huh. What that means is that it's, um, the deletion is actually taking out the um, part of A6 and part of A7, creating a completely new transcript that looks like A6 and A7, but they are different from uh, both. So essentially, it's a deletion and a fusion. It is expressed? Um, it is expressed. Okay. Yeah. And now we have Cynthia Bell. Of course. <laughs>